Okay, good evening. Uh, my name is Chris Carragher. I am the founder of Seacoast Paddleboard Club. I really appreciate everyone taking time out uh, for tonight's paddle chat. I hope everyone is doing well, staying healthy. Um, really, again, take, appreciate everyone taking the time out. The goal of these chats is to bring the paddleboard community uh, together here in New Hampshire and across the country so we can kind of learn from one another, uh, share stories, and stay optimistic. So a little bit about Seacoast Paddleboard Club for those that are unfamiliar with us. We are, in fact, a social club that was founded back in Portsmouth in 2015. We have just shy of 100 members who actively paddle in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Massachusetts. Our club motto is to get out of the water, have fun, and give back. So in addition to hosting regular meetup paddles, SBC also hosts regular charity events, uh, beach cleanups, and other activities to support our local communities. If you'd like to learn more about us or join us, uh, I'd encourage you to check out SeacoastPaddleboardClub.com or visit us on Facebook or Instagram. Before we kick off tonight's paddle chat presentation, uh, we always give pause here uh, and thank those that can't be with us. We have a lot of uh, nurses, healthcare professionals, and essential workers that are doing their part during COVID-19, and they're always in our thoughts, thinking about them. We miss paddling with them, and hopefully we will all be together again paddling soon. A couple of housekeeping tips. This presentation is being recorded. You will be able to access this after the fact on YouTube. Uh, for quality purposes, all participants are on mute. If you have a question, and I'm sure, I'm hoping everyone has a lot of good questions, we have a great presentation tonight, please use the QA chat feature and myself or Lily will be able to hop on your question. With that said, uh, tonight's paddle chat, Take Care of Your PFD and It Will Take Care of You is being presented by Lily Colby. Lily is the co-owner and chief PFD diva of MTI Life Jackets. Her husband and business partner, Gordon, have over 40 years of experience working together in the outdoor and paddle sports industry. They met in 1993 while working for Mad River Canoe in Waitsfield, Vermont, where Gordon was a brand manager and product designer, and Lily was in-house customer service and sales rep. They've worked for Mad River till it became part of Confluence Water Sports. In 2002, they left North Carolina to join MTI, MTI Adventurewear outside of Boston. After nine years of running the company from the Takashini family, they purchased it in 2011. Now headquartered in the historic mill building near the waterfront in North Plymouth. Uh, Gordon handles the product design and Lily oversees the sales and marketing. Best known for building quality USCG approved life jackets for all types of paddle sports, MTI was early to recognize the advantage of the inflatable belt pack PFD for Santa paddleboarders. They introduced the first belt pack, the Zephyr, in 2007. In 2009, Gordon redesigned the Zephyr to be more SUP focused, and they launched the Fluid at Surf Expo in 2010. MTI now offers three models of the USCG approved belt pack for PFDs, uh, priced from $75 to $135. Lily and Gordon have grown three millennial kids and live in Plymouth, Mass, not far from the Sagamore Bridge. They love to paddle, sail, and alpine ski. Lily serves on the board of the American Canoe Association, and Gordon is the vice president of the Life Jacket Association. With that, I'm very excited to turn it over to Lily Colby. Lily. Hey. Take it away. Here we are. This is my kitchen. Yep. Coming live to you from my kitchen in Plymouth, Mass. Um, it's also been my home office and Gordon's home office since March 23rd. So week 11, day 52, but who's counting? 
You see this coming. Gordon's got an office upstairs. I got an office downstairs right below me. Got our own little down nabby going on. Anyways, if, uh, if you ask me a really hard technical question, I'll probably yell to him and say, Gordon, come on down here, help me. So you may get a, a surprise visit from him during this presentation. And uh, this is my first time doing this, so I'm going to scroll up my fabulous PowerPoint piece now, I think. Chris? Technical. I am here. It's just a uh, show. There, there, it is. there it is. Oh my God. Okay. Here we go. <sighs> there is it is. It? All right. Okay. Um, so, everyone in our company, we're a small company and we're spread out all over the place. And I want to thank them for working so hard during these really uh, challenging times. We've been shipping when we can. And we've got employees working in Duxbury and in Situate and in Marshfield and in Kingston and over in Wareham and here in Plymouth. Um, so uh, glad to have everyone here tonight. Hopefully they're watching. They're not. So here's what I'm going to talk about. About a little bit about MTL Life Jackets. Um, I'm going to talk about PFD foam ins uh, inspection, foam jackets, inflatable jackets. I'm going to focus on belt packs since we're family paddlers. And uh, we also do a yoke style inflatable, but I'm going to talk about belt packs because that's typically what people are paddling with for stand up. And um, you'll notice in this photograph, um, it's being worn in the front. I know everyone wears it around the back. I do it too. Um, but it's really designed to be worn in the front. That's a nice picture. And at the end, I've got uh, recommendations for COVID-19 sanitization um, recommendations. So that's important right now. So a little bit about MTI. Chris covered a lot of it in the intro. Um, this is our new logo, uh, the Fluid logo. That's rolling out new for 2020. You'll see it on some of the new product. And then this is our current logo. We've had that for a long time. Um, I was managing our brand when we went to this logo 16 years ago. MTI, what does MTI stand for? Marine Technologies International. And uh, I love finding this little number, which is the cover of the first catalog uh, for MTI. It was founded, the company was founded in 1991 by the Takashina family, which is a Japanese American family. Um, and they were founded. Uh, outside of Boston in Watertown. Um, I think the first couple of years they made a hand sewn life jackets in the garage, but very quickly they took advantage of their Asian connections and started building life jackets over in Asia. They were one of the first companies to have a joint venture partnership with a Chinese company and they built life jackets in Shanghai. Um, and then 10 years ago or so, uh, opened up a factory in Vietnam, which is awesome. There's great coffee there. I love visiting that factory. Everything's U.S. Coast Guard approved. Everything is inspected by you all inspectors. Um, the quality of production is very high, and the standard of living is very high for those employees. Um, and I've had lunch in the break room in the Vietnam factory, and uh, I wasn't sure what I was eating, but it was really good. Um, if you look at this first cover, so MTI stands for Marine Technologies International. I'm like, what the heck? It says Marine Technology International. And I'm like, wow, did the first catalog have a typo on the cover? And um, in the bottom right-hand side, you see the MTI and the yellow uh, and the slogan, Adventure Wear for Water Planet. Um, yeah, our, our, I don't feel bad about changing our logo because it's been changed a lot of times. Uh, next year, 2021 will be the 30th anniversary of MTI. Um, so we've got a long history um, and certainly my kids grew up wearing it. Um, maybe your kids do, maybe you did. Um, so Gordon and I were in office romance at Red River Canoe and uh, that's us paddling a tandem whitewater canoe. Um, we were testing it and just coming out of the mold. That was a lot of fun. And um, in 2002, we joined MTI, moved, the company moved to Weymouth at that point, and 
we moved to Plymouth in 2006. 2007, uh, I want to make that a marker because that's when MTI introduced the inflatable life jackets to uh, the line. Um, the Helios, the yoke style, we still call it the Helios. We haven't changed that name since 2007. The Zephyr became the fluid. And um, I, you know, I'm sure there are people out there that might have the square fluid. So the photograph on the right is at Nucopia, uh, the spring of 2009. And that's that red Zephyr belt pack red, big square, boxy thing, bunch box. And um, we were there at that show. It's a canoe show. They sell a lot of paddle boards there now, but then there were no paddle boards in the hall, not at all. So we were selling an inflatable belt pack to kayakers and canoeists, and they were like, what is that? So how much things have changed since 2007? And the next one, Surf Expo, 2010. Our first booth was a little 10 by 10. I hardly brought any of the foam jackets. I just brought the inflatables. Uh, the banner of the gal in the back, that's actually Gordon's cousin, Amanda. And uh, she did a video for me, falling in the water, inflating it, coming to the surface, showing, and she was on this paddle board. And I kid you not, it, you know, she's, you know, we had paddle boards. We got them from Vic and some of our other industry friends. We had them on this lake in New Hampshire. And uh, we were the only people there with paddle boards. Everyone around the cottage were going, like, what the heck is that? And uh, now there's lots of them. So 2011, Gordon and I bought the company from the Takashinas, but they still build product for us in Vietnam. And um, so we're very closely tied with them. Um, we have other factories that we use now as well, but um, the belt packs and play will still come from um, Takashina uh, factory. And uh, we went from that stupid red foxy thing. And I'm, I'm like, Gordon, we got we got to make this more interesting to look at. Uh, I got some show and tell. This was from my garage. And this is that boxy belt pack. Um, and, and it was not red, and it, it has, it's a woody car, you see the wheel, and then on the front, on the top, it has a surfboard on the top. This is so cute, so we use prints, we have fun with colors, and belt pack, maybe some of you have the fluid in the aqua blue. Um, we are only offering the black one now. We're sort of tightening up our selection and the market condition. But we have three colors of the very affordable 16G, which is the slim belt pack on the left of the screen. The SUP safety belt is just in black, and the fluid is just in black. Good, better, best. Um, um, our headquarters are in Plymouth, Mass. We're a small company. The Bottom left picture shows uh, Cordage Park. That's taken from our warehouse from the loading bay for UPS and looking across to our office. We don't have the whole building. <laughs> we just have the ground floor level of the corner. But it's right near the waterfront, so that's cool. So our design inspiration comes from our backyard. This photograph I took at about 5 a.m. from our family summer cottage. And it's I have it in this presentation because it shows something really critical about taking care of your life jacket. And that is the life jackets that are on the railing, drying. And I can, so this, this summer cottage was built in 1896 by my husband's family. And uh, it's where he proposed to me and it's where we got married. And in the little, boathouse next to the house where we put all the beer, all the noodles, um, all the life jackets. Those life jackets that are sitting on that railing are still in that boathouse because we take care of them. Not, they're not really insane about taking care of them. You know, like I'm going to give you some tips about maintenance for life jackets. We don't do those tips on those, but we dry them. And that's like the biggest thing. If I can have you take away from this webinar is is 
after you use your life jacket, please dry it out before you stow it. I've seen more life jackets killed from just being moldy and gross and not being treated by between paddling. And uh, does anyone know where this lake might be? It's in New Hampshire, so that's a hint. I don't know, Chris, if you could hear that from, or get that read from. Yeah, I mean, this is, I would reach out to the audience and if you have an answer, just use the QA feature, just type in the answer. It I have, I have some thoughts. Southern New Hampshire. I want to say, oh. It will, it takes us about three hours going from Plymouth right to Boston. Uh. It's really, really beautiful. I, my guess would be Lake Winnipesaukee. No, close. Oh, I am. Well, three hours. Yeah, all right. I'm, I'm looking for the audience here. They got to chime in. Um, the Hay Estate. I mean, we're looking across the Hay Estate. Mm -hmm. And just down the lake, where the Narrows, this is the Narrows of the lake near the Gray Island. And. There's a big traffic circle and there's a state park, which is an awesome place to put in to go stop paddling. It's a really great place to stop paddling. Yay. Oh, here we go. Uh, Quabbin? Nope. Not Quabbin. All right, I'll tell you. Lake Santa Fe. Ah. Uh, that photograph was with no filter. That's, that's, the a way, uh, that's a beautiful photo. Um, but it relates to what we're talking about, which is dry your life jackets out. And they will last a really long time. So, so what I hear you say, Lily, is you shouldn't just take off your PFD and throw it in your trunk and leave it there all summer? <laughs> <laughs> I am yeah, guilty. Then we want you to buy a new one. But <laughs> no, you don't want to have to buy one new one really quickly. <laughs> so um, poll question. So Chris... You wanted to do a poll question since that was such a pretty picture of a great place to paddle in New Hampshire. Yeah, I think, uh, let me see if I can cue this up. Can you, uh... all right. I'm gonna end the poll. So, looks like uh, the poll results. Can you see that? Let me see. Error with me. I'm going to just share my screen so you can see the poll results now. Actually, I'm going to relaunch the polling. Have you done a poll before, Chris? Here we go. No, this is, this is trial and error. <laughs> All right. So we're typically, where is your favorite place to paddle? Go ahead. Let's see what the answers are here. Ooh, it's moving. Lakes. <laughs> We're giving about 30 seconds, so another 10 seconds here. Yeah. Eight. Yeah. There we go. Lakes. All right. Check Three. out Lake Sunapee. All right. So lakes, yeah, look at that, 64%. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, so check out Lake Sunapee. Um, there's quite a few stand up paddle boards zooming around now. It's kind of cool. And, um, it's accessible through the state park. There's a big traffic circle. One way it goes up to Lake Sun to a Mount Sunapee, the ski area. The other part of the traffic circle goes right down to the lake to the state park. I think they charge you five bucks for a car on the weekend to get in. They charge you, um, but it's worth it. It's a really great place to go. So next slide. Okay out of the way. How to care for your PFD so it can take care of you. Let's get down to the... All right, regular maintenance. After each use, rinse in fresh water. So we're in Lake Sanofi, it's spread, it's really fresh water, it's very clean water. Um, but if you've been out paddling and you're sweating in the life jacket. Even though you're on fresh water, uh, that sweat has salt in it. 
And over time, if you don't rinse the life jacket, it will corrode the zipper and kind of get funky just because of the salt in your sweat. So rinsing in fresh water, even if you've been paddling on fresh water, and hang to dry. That's that the, the railing at Sunapee, hang it to dry. Usually the next morning we come out and everything's dry. Um, it depends on how day up the day is, but pretty much overnight it, it dries out. Now that is gonna be tilted once we get to the COVID recommendations it's about the drying time. Uh, seasonally, wash with mild detergent soap. Again, hang to dry. So I'm talking mild. All right, get a bucket, Home Depot bucket, get a big bucket, fill it with water. I kind of like Meyer soap, it just smells so good. Use mild soap. Think about what we're being told about washing our hands, right? Soap and water, 20 seconds. But soap and water do a lot to clean. Power of soap and water. Don't forget that. But don't overkill. Uh, we heard from an outfitter that was like freaking out because the life jacket stamp in the back, the life jacket was peeling off. And they're like, we wash those jackets every day in simple green, <laughs> which is a degreaser. It's like, yep, there's your Coast Guard stamp right off. So be easy. Go with a mild detergent. The other thing that we, I love to recommend, and we don't sell this, so this is just, just telling you, 303 protectant. 303 protectant. Um, it is not like Armorall, which is uh, oil-based, it's water-based. They fuse around water, and it is a sunscreen for your PFD. So when you get a brand new life jacket, if you can put some 303, it's great to be in the kitchen. This has been a great break room too, in my home office. You let that dry, it, it, will, it will deepen the color. You'll see it right away. But the great thing is, is that over time it will maintain the color of your life jacket. Keep it from fading. One of the tests that 303 did many years ago was they took some life jackets and they put 303 on one and no 303 on an exact one, duplicate one, and they nailed it to their roof and they let it stay all year for a year in the sun, in the rain, in the snow. And um, actually, there's 40. Did they forget about it? Did you think there's a funny story? Like they kind of forgot yeah, it there. Was yeah. Anyways, was it like three years later? They finally were like, oh yeah. It was like, they, went it's the tested. they went up to the roof. The one without the 303 was basically in tatters. Like the fabric was just like pulling apart. The one with 303 was in pretty good shape. It wasn't perfect, but it was pretty good shape. I tried to find that slide for this presentation. I couldn't somewhere I got it. But 303, it's your friend. Outfitters can buy it in gallon sizes. You can add a cup of it to your soaps, uh, to your water occasionally. And annually, annually, <laughs> we want to inspect for wear and tear, and we're going to get into that next. So how to inspect your foam life jacket. Um, going to whiz through that first, and then we'll talk about belt packs. But I'm going to grab a life jacket that I see a lot of use kind of demonstrate, hopefully you can see it on the screen all right. But you're gonna check the fabric shell, you're gonna check the foam, you're gonna check the zippers, the clips, the Velcro, the pockets, and the buoyancy with a swim test. If you have an old foam life jacket and you're worried that it doesn't have enough buoyancy in it after, after all these years, put it on, get in the water, see how it floats you, simple. People don't think of doing it. Um, so we have some professional life jacket abusers. Um, they're ambassadors. They do amazingly fantastic things. So I kind of live always jealous of their trips and life in the wilderness. 
Dave and Amy Freeman are, are some of our great friends for many years. Uh, the Wilderness Classroom, they've been named National Geographic Explorers of the Year. And back in 2013, they did this North American Odyssey. They paddled from Alaska to Florida. They had sea kayaks and they dog sledded through Canada. And then they went back to sea kayaks through the Great Lakes. And they went up through the canal and they came down through Maine and they stopped at Plymouth because they stayed three days with us. And what they would do is they would stop along the way and they would go to schools and they would present to children about what they were doing and the environment. And they also um, were uh, connected to teachers and school children across the country um, through their wireless, the satellite, um, satellite phones, satellite computers. And they were, um, I believe they had nearly 100,000 children uh, actually following in classrooms um, what they were doing. I think probably we need them to go out and do that again during this uh, homeschooling, COVID schooling shutdown. But anyway, so 2000, well, 2012, they stopped with us. Uh, they made it to Key West, Florida in 2013. And the, the jacket that Amy's wearing there in the picture is this one right here, the, a PFD bug. It has 6,000 water miles on it. And you know what? It's actually still pretty good. Um, so it's really faded. You can see that in the photograph, right? Really faded. So if you're going to have a foam jacket, you're going to use this on your belt packs too. So I want you to look at your fabric. I want you to see if it's faded, sort of pull on it, you know, see if it's going to give way. Fading suggests that the fabric is weakened, but depends on the quality of the vest. If you have an expensive vest, you have a Cordura fabric, ripstop fabric, if you've got a heavier, durable fabric, it's going to fade, um, even though all of the life jack fabrics are UV tested and have to meet very high standards. Um, still, in different colors fade at different rates, um, so you will get some fading. And there was no way that um, Amy was going to use any 303 as she went along. She hardly had room to put her butt in that kayak, so... Um, so anyways, she didn't care. And I said, look, do you want me to set you up with a new life jacket? Um, you still have from Massachusetts to Key West to go. And she said, no way. You know, we looked at it. So we checked the fabric. We checked the seams. We checked the webbing. So on this side of the life jacket, you can see this. She likes to carry her the knife is still here on the side. And the knife created some fraying of the webbing, but it's still strong and it's not giving way. And, you know, I don't see it ripping. So she's like, you know, it's really broken in. It's super comfortable. And if you give me a brand new life jacket and then we paddle through the canal and we go down to Connecticut, the next stop we do and lecture we do, if we have brand new life jackets, no one's going to believe that we paddled all the way from Alaska. So no, let, let us have the, the sort of beat up, broken in life jackets they didn't want to trade. And looking at the life jacket, it looked in good condition. So that's what you want to do in your annual check. You know, go and clip the clips, see if they're still functioning. The tip here, open up any pockets, look inside. So she's got one pocket, which is pretty clean, the other pocket is, is where she had her, would keep her power bar, and it's, you can tell. Um, and I have been, <laughs> you hear everything when you work with life jackets for nearly 20 years. Um, uh, someone who left their power bar in their pocket and a mouse got in and had a piece all winter and then decided to die in the pocket. So you're so happy, I guess. And uh, so they're like, God, oh, my life jacket smells really bad. My life jacket, an MTI, and my life jacket smells really bad. What am I going to do about this funk? Well, there's things you get, like sink the sink and air mirrors on and stuff to take a funky smell out of life jackets. But I'm like, oh, did you look in the pockets? Oh, I said no. So check your pockets. So, Lily, quick question here. Um, just got a question from Nick. And 
here is I've heard one should replace a foam jacket every five years due to foam breakdown. Oh, I, I love that, that question. I actually turned around and got some foam ah. while you were asking that question. <laughs> so good uh, job, Nick. It depends on the jacket you have, the quality of the jacket. Honestly, guys, if you've kicked it out and spent a little bit more money for a life jacket right now, the modern foams are pretty stable. So this is shows a foam of a less expensive life jacket. Who is it, Gordon? It's PE. E -E. E -E. E -E. E Okay, and it's in layers, so that's what sort of softens it, sort of stiffer foam. But um, this is a more expensive life jacket. You can see that it's contoured on the inside. That's the secret for how these jackets sort of mold around your body. And this is a PVC foam, and it's pretty darn stable. Um, but so. But check it out. I have seen this. So this is a, a type two jacket. You know, it's familiar. This is not an MTI. And uh, this is the kind of jacket that, you know, how many people are just uh, putting this under a bungee cord on the top of the board? So it's in the sun all the time. If it's on the ocean, it's getting salt. And you're kind of not, you're not going to wear it, hopefully ever. And so it's getting pretty abused. Um, and I've definitely seen this uh, tell you jacket um, where the foam was like like talcum powder. You push your finger in it and your finger would go right in the foam. Um, so that's a good test to do. Take your life jacket, push your finger. <laughs> and uh, if your finger dents into the foam, uh, that's, that, get rid of that. That's bad. Um, and um, but would you agree, Gordon, that the more contemporary phone the, is... The service life is going to be at least five years unless you remove the jacket. So if you're not sitting on it, if you're not kneeling on it, if you're not doing that kind of stuff at the campsite or something like that after it's being used, it's likely to be very stable. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> um, yeah. I hate to say that. <laughs> we kind of put it a little... Yeah. Little dissolves, expiration dissolves after no, four years. We actually want you to have your life jackets for a long time. Like I said, think of our summer cottage. A lot of those life jackets in there are oh, as long many as it's years structurally old. sound and it's got enough buoyant force to keep you up in the water where you're comfortable wearing it. Can you hear that? It's, it's the voice of God. <laughs> and uh, so again, go do that swim test. You know, put your life jacket on and, and get in the water. And if it's not holding, you know, if it's not holding your body neutral in the water, then I wouldn't worry. Does that answer the question? It, yeah, I think that we have one request though coming from uh, Renee. Um, if we can, it looks like, you're when you're making a presentation with your slides next to you you're kind of a small thumbnail if we could actually get you to open up when you're doing the kind of show and tell if we can lose the presentation slides this way you'll be full screen and everyone will be able to see you a little bit bigger do that. uh just uh stop sharing the presentation slides Ooh. let's try that how's that yeah, that's beautiful ah is that right. good, Renee? Renee, can I get a thumbs up there? <laughs> okay. So, uh, foam. More expensive foam. And this is your type 2, not an MTI. Um, so, you guys know type 2s. Those of you that aren't wearing life jackets and just putting them on your board, you're perfectly legal. You're carrying a legal life jacket on your board, but it's better if you wear it, as long as it's U.S. Coast Guard approved. And uh, looking for a life jacket company, I do get the call occasionally. Oh my God, I was out downwind and it was awesome. I took my leash broke, and then my board was gone. And, uh, Offshore Mile, Cape Cod Bay, 
He calls and he goes, I probably would have drowned if I didn't have a belt pack on. He inflated it. I got to swim. My board was gone. So, you know, playable life jackets, uh, sort of like the airbags in your car. You hope you never have to use it. But if you have to use it, it could save your life. It's not a guarantee, but it could save your life. And it gives you an awful better, bigger, better chance. Um, should I go back to the, well, well, we'll jump to the inflatable life jackets. Yeah, let's do that. I mean, if we could keep you full screen, I think. Okay. So, yeah, be great. So there's, uh, so again, you're going to want to check the shell. Oh, okay. I'll let you see this. Cause you probably saw this really small. This is, this is the belt pack, the old square one, old fluid, the first fluid that looks like a, a little woody car. And it has a surfboard printed on the top. Okay. And that's from 2010, so that's old. It's in great condition. Um, so again, you're going to be checking the zippers, the fabric, the clips. And actually, I am going to go back to the screen here because I have the inside of the pack is where it really gets interesting. Okay, so CO2 cylinders. You've got bayonet style, you've got threaded with the green pin, you've got cylinders which are 33 gram, 24 gram, 16 gram. I'll go back here. And there's more, but those are the most common ones. So, All right, bayonet, whoops, there we go, ah, bayonet, a threaded end with a green pin. That's, this is a 16 gram, that's a 24 gram, and then, see, the top of there, the 33 gram. So there's quite a big difference in the size of the cylinders and the ends. There's so many tracks out there, you have to look on the inside. So I'm gonna go back to this. Oops, where's my mouse? There it is. Okay. All right, threaded with the green pin. And this is probably easier to see from the screen than from me in my kitchen. Um, this is the kind that you screw in. You've got that tiny little green pin, which that tiny little end of it is designed to break. So it's fragile, so be careful with it. And once you put it in the little housing, you know where that little red U is? Don't remove it, because if you try to take it out, you're going to break it. Um, we actually ship our new jackets without that pin installed, and we have this big sign. I think you can probably see this if I hold this up, even in the small big sign that says, warning, this is not armed. You need to do it first. Um, because People love to pull the, you know, the jerk tag in the store, and if you pull it, you're gonna break that pin. It may not inflate, it won't inflate the life jacket because the cylinder is not screwed in. Um, but so, we, so we, we like you to arm it. Once you put that pin in there, leave it there. And the other kind of end is a bayonet end. So it's a plastic end, and it is glued to the end of the steel cylinder. Let me repeat that, it's glued to the end. Um, we've had a number, we occasionally get people who call who, they have one with a thread and can they buy a plastic end? It's like, no, it's one single piece. Um, and if you have a fluid or a sub safety belt or any of the inflatable life jackets that uses this kind of inflator, What's great about it is that you just insert it and you twist and the green indicator window shows green. That actually means it's armed. 
with the pin, you can have the pin in. You don't have the cylinder in. That's why on the bladder, it's printed check cylinder seal because you if you can think that you're armed because the bean pin is in unless you have the cylinder in the inflator mechanism then it's not going to work so what i like about the bayonet style and that is on our more expensive jackets so the fluid the sub safety belt is that when you're armed you're armed and with the fluid of the self safety belt, there's a window that you can tell at a glance and look to see the arming status without opening the pack. And that's actually, that mechanism and being able to check that arming status through the window, uh, those two belt packs are approved as a type three. Um, they're legal, worn or carried, although we prefer you wear it. Um, a lot of jackets that has that pin. The pin basically is a classified as a five. And a five, let's demystify, just demystify the five is like anything that doesn't neatly fall into a one, two, or three, um, or four. It's a special instructions and you have to read the label. And if you open up your belt pack and you read the fewest Coast Guard label, you'll probably read, if it's a five, we'll say you have to wear it to be legal because, you know, you want to make sure that you've armed it properly. So um, that's why the bayonet is, in my mind, the more premium inflator mechanism. It's more foolproof. Hey, Lily, I got a couple of questions coming in here. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is, is it possible to acquire a spare little green plastic pin? Yes. It is? Awesome. Yes. OK. Um, if it's an MTI, just contact us. I'll send you some. Um, but you can buy them as. Oh parts but they're tiny little things they're not very expensive so um just contact me through mti lifejackets.com and say i need green pin that's awesome and as a follow-up to that there's a question here is it okay to put never seize lubricant on threads of the co2 banister to ease eventual replacement Gordon? <laughs> Uh, it's not part of the certification process. Yeah. Uh, I don't even know what that is. What's that mean? Well, it's, it's a thread protector. Um, mm. So you, you probably, it's, it's not designed that way. They're not designed to tolerate that. And they weren't tested that way. So having said that, it's probably not going to hurt anything as long as it doesn't gum up the works, which it shouldn't. I, I should think that would be fine. Having said that, part of your practice with taking care of an inflatable is removing the cylinder when you're not using it. Because you'll reduce the opportunity to inadvertently inflate it, which saves lots of money. And it also uh, just preserves the whole pack and the mechanism and everything else better. So, and then it also lends itself to inspection more easily because you can look and see if the mechanism is working, the lever arm is working, and the cylinder, obviously, you know it threads because you're threading it back in. It's not that hard to do any of those things, so it's a good idea just as a matter of routine to practice taking that. Um, awesome. Thank you, Gordon. There you go. Good. Good. <laughs> there we go. That's how that works. Um, uh, actually, actually, I have one other question. Oh. And, and by the way, the person that asked that question, oh, good to know, removing cylinder. Very appreciative of the answer, so that's awesome. Here's a good question, and this is a question I think we could all ask ourselves as a club, club members, as MTI, you know, how can we get more people, paddleboarders specifically, to wear a PFD? I mean, it's really peer pressure. It's like, just use common sense, but I'll well, leave the question to you. I think we can all be good role models for others. And uh, certainly a lot of the magazines and media and companies are trying to get people shown wearing life jackets when they have beautiful pictures of them paddling somewhere. Um, so it's, it's a challenge. Um, and, you know, I'd rather not see a law that says everyone has to have a life jacket on all the time. I'd rather be more of a person's choice. So, so for us, it's like, let's 
design stuff that looks great, um, is affordable, and that can encourage people to wear it. If, you know, if, if we go to the, the mountain, we're alpine skiers, and, uh, but you know, I like borders too. But we're all wearing helmets. And uh, that was sort of, it's not a law. We don't have to, mm -hmm. a law that you have to wear a helmet when you ski or snowboard. Um, but we're all kind of doing it by encouragement and the, and the products that the companies are making are phenomenal. You know, you got music inside, you got really cushy. So if, if the product, I saw companies lift their product and I, and I really looked at the helmet companies, you know, what are those guys doing to encourage wear of helmets? They've done it by creating great products and that's certainly what we try to do with MTI. So, does that answer that question? Absolutely. That was a great question. Okay. A great answer. That is, that is a very good question. So you guys can help do this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you guys can help. Be good role models. Yeah, that's our club really pushes safety. We're a safety first organization, safety of culture, all that good stuff. So. Yeah. Um, so that, Dan and, oh, did I go backwards? I did. Sorry. Uh, oh, did everyone see the picture of the broken? ring um the top right versus the one intact so on the bayonet end that ring is designed to break when you pull the bird peg. so that's a vulnerable place so if you drop your cylinder on the garage floor hard and it breaks that ring um it's not going to work properly in the inflator mechanism um, so that's something to check is that ring attached Okay, let's go this way. So there are so many different shapes and sizes of the bladders on the inside. So the top photo, here Gordon, take a look at this. You can see this when I was doing this. So the top photo shows two Bayonet N belt pack life jackets. One's a 24 gram ours, the blue one is ours. The 33 gram is a different brand. Look at the difference of the bladder on the inside. Completely different. And then the bottom picture shows our 16G belt pack. That's the screw in type with a pin. And the one next to it, which is not our brand, is a 33 gram screw in type. So the cylinder's like way bigger. The bladder inside is way bigger. I mean, it's, it's a small pack. So on the out, when you look at the packs, the packs all look compact and small. On the inside, they're all quite different. And by law, on the inside, it will tell you what cylinder you need to replace, to replace it. They all have a red oral tube. You'll see that on all these bladders. And so if you want to test the bladder for its inflation to make sure it's still buoyant, you're going to use that red. You don't have to use the cylinder unless you want to buy a fresh cylinder you know, one of the things that you should do is look at the cylinder you have and look at the manufacturing date that's stamped on the cylinder. Now it's a, it's a sealed, steel cylinder. And if it's not corroded, that's, you should definitely look at your cylinder, see if there's any corrosion, get rid of it if there's corrosion. Get yeah. rid of it if the ring is broken. But if, there's, if it hasn't been punctured, it looks in good shape, the gas is still in there. Seal fluid. It's a noble gas. It's yeah. good state. But if you feel, oh my God, I have had this. I have had no accidents. So here's a cylinder, manufactured, fill date, 2015. In really good condition. I'd use it. I'd be okay. Here's another one. It's a lot older, and I can't even read the manufactured date on it. It's in good condition. But if you are at all worried, five, if it's five years old, so five years, officially it's five years. Officially. That's, that's the official shelf life. But I think generally speaking, those things go for quite a long time. Yeah. Again, not trying to not sell you extra cylinders. But. <laughs> right, so does anyone have any questions about that? There, no, 
There's no question. Now, I think if we could go full screen just real quick because the, so they could actually see the cylinder, that would be great. Stop there. there we go. go. Uh, okay, so here's the cylinder and the manufacturer. This, this says date fill. So this is a cylinder that was uh, supplied with the pack from Asia. And then the best company in the States is Leland, their US company. They make, they make cylinders for like NASA and stuff and for us, isn't that really cool? Paintball guns. And paintball guns. And, and on the Leland cylinder, so that's the thread kind. Whoops, there we go. And on that, you'll see it says manufacture date, like second up from the bottom. This is 5, 2015. I'd still use it. Yep. No, it's fine. It, it really is. It's about looking at the foil. I think Lily showed you that, but you can kind of see that very end of the foil is not pierced. It's clean, looks good. It should be fine. CO2 is a really stable gas. They're zinc plated cylinders, so they're pretty hard to kill, but salt go. water will. This is why I have this guy, because I did not know it was zinc. That's exciting stuff. Okay. All right. Can I go back to my PowerPoint? Absolutely. Please. All right. Boom. So, sheer. Okay, so regular maintenance will dramatically extend the life of your life jacket. I have to tell you, we're pretty lazy. And up at the cottage, you know, we dry them, we rinse them occasionally. They're in great shape. All the stuff, like from my garage. I'm not particularly careful, but I am careful to the extent that always hang to dry. Occasionally, you know, rinse and fresh water often. Uh, only use mild detergent. You don't need to overkill it. Um, use products like 303 Protectorant. Love this stuff. Uh, check the CO2 cylinder before paddling. Make sure you're armed and because there's so many different kinds out there. Inspect the vests for wear and tear and don't don't use vests that are that are need to be retired. And salt water is it's critical to rinse after yeah. salt water use. It'll even we've switched to plastic car zippers a long time ago and got rid of metal, but they still seize. They still get, you know, if you leave them, they, they just, it corrodes like crazy. It destroys urethane coatings on fabric. It's it just rinse them off. If, if especially salt water. Yeah. Once a zipper gets seized up, it's really hard to open. We've got one guy, who I'm working with and he's left his really nice knife in his pocket. Well, he's got an old, and he's got a metal car zipper. It's one yeah. of our old, yeah. it's, it's a 15 year old 15 year old jacket. So, and he's like, did you rinse it? Like, no. Um, yeah, and he's like, you're just gonna need to cut that pocket open to get that knife. Uh, so then, I'm, oh. unless someone has questions, I'm gonna move yeah. to the new normal. Yes, I think there's, I see I a couple. It's late. Yeah, absolutely. Looking at time and looking at some of the questions that are coming in, I know we have a couple of folks that actually own and run uh, rental outfit, outfits. Uh, outfits. Please, yes. <laughs> rental outfits. Yeah. There it is. That's the one. So yeah, I, I know they are very interested to hear about uh, how do we keep people safe and healthy. Okay, well, let's, I'm, I'm going to sort of go through this. The good news is that uh, this information is on our website. Um, it's on the Life Jacket Association website, and it's on the U.S. Coast Guard website. And Gordon, through his work with the Life Jacket Association, he worked with other North American life jacket brands to put together the recommendations, which um, are summarized you know, in short here. Um, so, you know, based on what we know right now, you know, COVID-19 is primarily spread through direct contact, but it can survive on surfaces for three days. And all this is kind soft, of changing. Soft surfaces. Soft surfaces, yeah. It appears it can survive for three days on some hard surfaces. You've probably heard it will 
survive long. And uh, so if you're worried that you need to sanitize, find some rubber gloves. First of all, hand wash. Don't machine wash a life jacket. If it's foam one, it's just gonna bunch them up. And you just don't want to machine wash life jackets. It even says that on the US Coast Guard stamp on, on the life jackets. You know, fill your bucket with water, mild detergent. Uh, if it's a foam vest, you're gonna to need to hold it down because it's gonna to want to float. Agitate it in the water, like what, 30 seconds? Depending on how many life jackets you're trying to wash. Uh, don't use bleach. Um, the hardware, number two, the hardware, zippers, buckles, Velcro, that can be difficult to clean. Um, so you can use a, you know, 70 to 90% solution of alcohol water to help clean those components. But be, be careful, alcohol is kind of tough on the fabric. And so if you get a, you get a spray bottle, I know it looks tiny in your screen, you know, fill it up. 70, you know, say you're going to 10 ounces of simple maths, math, so seven ounces alcohol, the rest water, and spray it into those areas. And after the washing, let it dry. And then finally, the, the dry completely. Now, this is the tough thing for outfitters. The recommendation is to dry them for 72 well, hours. The best thing you can do is keep it out of service for 72 hours because then you're as close as we can be to reasonably certain that the virus is going to be dead if it was there at all um, and isn't going to be transferred. You know, this is this is the problem with this is that there's still no real protocols out there uh, for how to deal with soft surfaces that can't be laundered. And it, sorry, <laughs> um, and it and it really means that uh, this is a cover your ass statement forgive me but that's mm -hmm. that's basically kind of where things are so that's the 72 hours is kind of the best advice we can get i personally think that uh, alcohol and using a detergent or soap solution and getting the jacket into hot water with that you're likely to break up the covalent bonds there's a lot of stuff out there all over the place as you've probably seen it suggests that all works, but nobody's tested it. There's no testing protocol that I'm aware of that the CDC has released or the WHO or anybody else for this kind of um, So some of it's use. relying on what works so, on the previous right. human coronavirus, the SARS. And well, not, not SARS, they're... but human corona. Yeah. And, and then other things, and, and so like viruses, seem to respond to a lot of these products. So there's a bunch of stuff out there. And I have a, one of the things that we researched today for this seminar is, and this is updated information on uh, yeah, the CDC so the, website. The EPA is, list carries this particular product that you're looking at as one of the ones that can be used as a laundry pretreatment and will effectively sanitize soft surface goods. Uh, the laundry sanitizer from Lysol is actually uh, allowable for delicate fabrics, so it should be okay, I think. But I wrote to Lysol some time ago asking them for some advice, and they came back saying, well, we haven't tested it against this, so we can't recommend it. Follow the directions on the label, but don't use it as it's not intended, which, you know, that's... That was what... their cover. <laughs> that's right. That wasn't very helpful. <laughs> So, but this but is, that's something. This is a commercially available product that I suspect will do the trick. Um, there are there are a lot of others. Uh, one of the ones that I recommend taking a look at, if you can, Odoban, out of California, does a great little presentation. They've got a really good on, YouTube video. Yeah. Yeah. And and they seem to be pretty straight up folks. We have some customers who are using their uh, their stuff in a dip. Um, and that's, their that's a mild, uh, you know, it's, it's, really it's, a, mild, it's, a, so. it's a disinfectant and they're using it's it at a pretty low, low ratio. I, I, I think the reality is that it's pretty unlikely that a life jacket is going to carry a transmission. But so our recommendations are for ways that, quite frankly, for people who are outfitters, that you can tell your customers we're going through this, we do this, we have this treatment policy. And we try and keep the jackets out of service as long as possible, but 
yesterday we had all the jackets out, so we disinfected them, we ran them through, we washed them, and we sprayed them down with alcohol, so you sh should be good to go. Yeah. I, so, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a... Yeah. I mean, using a local example, Charles River Keen and Kayak in Boston yeah. just bought, like, a thousand more life jackets so that they can... There, uh, there's the pitch. <laughs> so, which we didn't expect. We went from zero to suddenly Charles River going, 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 what do you have? Because they have to, they're going to do more rotation to spread out the right. use between jackets because they're going to... Uh, create the 72 hour drive. For most people, that's not feasible. They either don't have the space to do it or don't have the money or, or both or all three. You know, it's tough. It really is hard. I, I wish I had an easy magic bullet. But, but this know. is at least something. Yeah. No, there are some processes you can do. And as Lily said, it's available on our website, the Life Jacket Association website. She's got other stuff. There you go. Yeah. So just to summarize, I know it's getting late. Um, my, my soup is kind of boiling a little bit. Um, use gloves. Hand wash with mild soap, detergent, the mild sanitizer. Hottest water you can Hottest get. Hottest water if you can. Get it to where well, you're. Yeah, within reason. Hard, I mean, you know, but, boiling water is probably a bad idea. That probably won't help the life jacket or your hands. But uh, Spot clean the zippers with the solution. Dry completely for 72 hours. And... Right. Uh, Take care of your life jacket so it can take care of you. We love you. More information, lifejackets.com. Product care, lifejackets.com. COVID-19, right on our homepage, we've got a link to those COVID recommendations. It's a bit longer winded, but it's the same. The Life Jacket Association also has the COVID-19 recommendations. SafeBoatingCampaign.com. Um, they have an interesting link that shows the COVID-19 response and updates by state. So they've got a map on that, that part of their website. And you click on your state, and it sort of gives you what's new. Um, and then recommending 303 recre uh, Aerospace Protectorant. Um, available from West Marine, REI, Kittery Trading Post, other specialty retailers. Uh, we don't sell it, but anyways, we really recommend that. And finally, we thank you very much for your attention. Hopefully, we awesome. I want people to take away something they didn't know about life jacket. At least one thing. Everybody's asleep. Yeah. <laughs> never, never. No, thank you. There's a lot of good information there. I know I'm getting good feedback here from, again, some of my friends with the outfitters. Uh, and you guys are now the official PFD of Seacoast Paddleboard Club. So what's cooler than that? <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah, you know, the question about how do we promote where with other people that we love and we don't want to lose them is be a good role model yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you. I think you covered pretty extensive everything that folks need to do to stay safe and get out on the water. So I appreciate it. Well, thanks for coming to visit us in our kitchen and uh, we'll say goodbye and go have our soup. If you get some more questions, you probably can just email us and we can spin them back out to you. And you can, Abs you know, absolutely. Come for that. There we go. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>